here's our agenda for today. I'm going to cover the top 10 financial planning tips. Tammy's going to do risk management with insurance, and then Gigi's going to cover estate planning. And again, we'll do the Q&A at the end, if you don't mind. Um, so before I get into my tips, I wanted to ask a question. First of all, how many of you are uh, parents of children or future parents of children? Okay, so most of you, because so I have a bonus slide at the end of mine that I could skip over, <laughs> hope to be parents, uh, that I might skip over if there weren't, but it looks like it might apply. Um, and then the other thing I'm noticing, we've got a pretty broad range of ages in here, so we had to kind of aim for the middle. So I apologize, I don't know what your backgrounds are, your sophistication on finances, but you know, if, if we're not answering your questions during our prepared remarks, definitely ask us in the Q&A or afterwards. Um, okay, now, the reason I, I think this stuff is important and why I hope you're here is that, you know, you've really got to prepare to, to live your life and to um, be able to retire someday. And I think most people underappreciate how much they need to save for retirement. When I run financial plans for my clients and do retirement projections, I mean, most people that live in the Bay Area and kind of have six-figure incomes generally need to have several million dollars saved up by the time they retire at a, you know, mid-60s. And if you're one of those people that aspires to retiring early, you need even more than that. And what's happening is people are living longer and longer, and so you're going to end up having 30-plus years potentially in retirement, which could be as much or almost as much as you had working. So you've got to work hard to save up enough to then have as long a period of time in retirement um, as you had in your working career. So I think that is just underappreciated by people today, and a lot of people just aren't well prepared. So hopefully by being here, you're kind of taking this seriously and doing what you can now to, um, to set yourself up. So this top 10 list that I have, I'm, it's up on the screen, um, really came about because in my work with financial planning clients, I was finding that certain themes and recommendations were occurring again and again, regardless of circumstances. And so I realized that some of this is somewhat universal and can apply across people's circumstances. And so I've created this top 10 list. Now I'm going to go into each one in more detail in the coming slides. So I'm not going to really uh, review them here. You can read them. Um, and so I will move, move on. Um, okay. So let's advance. All right. So I'm going to start kind of big picture and then get into more detail in coming points. So the first point I make is that you really got to take stock and clarify your goals. And that really is kind of big picture. Figure out what's important to you, both what your values are, you know, what's kind of driving you in life, and what are you trying to accomplish. And then kind of take it to the next level and figure out, based on your values, what goals do you want to accomplish in life. Um, and if you're in a relationship, it's a good idea to sit down with your partner uh, and review your, your goals. And hopefully there's some alignment there. And if not, you've got to kind of have a negotiation and some compromise so that you can come up with a joint list of goals uh, together. And you know, common goals that people often have are buying a home, sending kids to college, taking a big trip. So figure out what your goals are and what you really want to accomplish. And then what you need to do the next step, because most of us don't have unlimited resources, is you need, need to figure out how much those goals are going to cost. And then second of all, try and prioritize them. What are the really must-have goals? And then what are some you know, nice-to-have goals if your resources allow? So that's really the first step, um, is to really figure out where you're going and what you're trying to accomplish. And I love this quote from Lewis Carroll, that if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So that's one way to go through life. But then you may end up at the end and not have achieved a lot of the things you want to achieve. Um, just make sure I didn't. Oh, there's this, um, so not too long ago, my husband and I went through this exercise. I don't know if you all have heard of Ted Leonis. He's some rich guy that owns some sports teams and stuff. He, he created this life list for himself called the 101 list, and you can Google it. And he just set up different categories of things he wanted to achieve in life. And like one of them's travel, another one's possessions, you know, there's just spiritual, family, different categories. And then he wrote down all these things he wanted to accomplish, and he keeps the list. And as he accomplishes them, he checks them off. And so my husband and I went through this process. And fortunately, you do it independently, and then you review together. And fortunately, when we went through that process, we were pretty well aligned. So there wasn't too much uh, compromise that needed to occur. But it was, it was really an interesting exercise. And now I kind of keep it top of mind. And when we're planning our vacation for the year, I'm like, OK, well, what's on our list that we need to you know, knock off instead of just letting life happen to us and you know, accepting invitations without really thinking about what we want to accomplish? Um, so at any rate, that is that point. Um, 
So once you've kind of figured out what's important to you and what goals you want to accomplish, you really got to get a handle on your cash flow. Because there's that saying, cash is king. I say cash flow is king. So if you can't live within your means and get control of your, your spending and make room for other important things, then you're never going to be able to accomplish these other goals you have. Because the money, it's easy for the money to go in and just go out and you have like no idea where it's going. So I tell people to focus first on figuring out where the money's been going. So whether you're using Mint or Quicken or just downloading data from your bank, uh, bank accounts, get the data and categorize it and figure out where you've been spending your money. And I, I like to think in buckets. Um, so I've got these three, I think they're actually in color here, three buckets. Uh, the red one's meant to be money past, and that's money you've committed to spend and can't easily change. So that's fi largely fixed expenses, so rent or mortgage, utilities, child care, things that are, you know, you could change, but will take a while to, to change. So that's money past, and that's usually most people's biggest bucket. And then the yellow bucket is called money present. And that's money you will spend in the next seven days on pretty highly discretionary things. So eating, gas, entertainment, things that you do on a daily basis and that you do have some control over if you need to make, um, to cut back. And then the last bucket I call money future. And that is either lumpy expenses that occur infrequently or savings goals. So saving for an emergency fund, saving for retirement, saving for a new car, uh, and the lumpy expenses are things like a vacation, holiday gifts, clothing, you know, things that you spend, home maintenance, auto maintenance, um, they're bigger expenses that come less frequently. So once you've kind of categorized your spending, hopefully in these three buckets, and you know where the money's going, it's easier to then say, okay, well, I don't need to be spending $500 a week on eating out and groceries. So you can trim, trim them back and make room to start directing more of your money to your savings goals, so whether it's saving for a new car or saving for a big vacation. Um, and what I do and, and recommend to some of my clients that are just needing more help with cash flow is to set up auto deposits out of your main checking account to fund these green um, money future goals. So have monthly transfers going once your paycheck hits to set aside the money in the vacation account and the auto maintenance account and the home maintenance account so that then when something happens, the money's there, instead of kind of always being reactive and like, oh, the car broke down, I've got to find money to pay for the car maintenance. So it really helps to kind of categorize things, put them in buckets, and then be more intentional about where you want your future money going. Um, just make sure I'm not missing anything here. Uh, so the next tip is to invest in yourself. Um, so when you're earlier in your career, your human capital, and human capital, I'm assuming most of you understand that concept because you have business degrees, but in case you don't, uh, it's the net present value of your future earnings stream. So when you're younger in your career, you have all these years ahead of you to work, and so your human capital is actually a very large asset on your holistic balance sheet, and your financial capital is usually a lot less. And then that flip-flops as you get further on in your career. So I like to really encourage people to really think of this human capital asset because we spend so much time focusing on our financial capital. But it's really important to also think about your human capital and be very proactive throughout your career in developing it and making sure you're headed the direction you want to go and that you're doing everything you need to stay on top of your industry and on top of your career and really invest in yourself. Um, and so that, that can take various forms. Most of you, because you got a degree at Berkeley, an MBA, that was investing in your human capital. But don't kind of say, I'm done now, I'm going to sit back and you know, harvest that for the rest of my life, because things change so much, industries change so much, that you need to continually kind of stay on top of your game and on your field. So going back to school, hiring a career coach, attending conferences, whatever it is that you need that's relevant to your chosen field, be continually thinking about this as you go through your career. Um, I also like to make this point to women because it's more common for women to take time off of their career to raise children. And I've read so many stories and heard so many stories about women having a hard time getting back on a career track after taking that time off. And so even if you do choose to take the time off, be always thinking about what do you want to do next and what's kind of the next phase of your life, and staying engaged in some form of fa or fashion, whether it's volunteering or 
you know, staying involved with an industry, working with a career coach to figure out where you want to go next. It's, it's really critical and particularly for people that take time off from their careers. Uh, let's see if there's, yeah, okay. And I, I was going to give an example just from my own personal career. I went to Berkeley, but then after that I, I went into the investment industry and the relevant certification in the investment industry for what I was doing was the CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. I went through that program. And then from there, I wanted to shift more into financial planning wealth management. And so the relevant certification there is the Certified Financial Planner designation. So I got that. And now I feel like I've got enough letters after my name, so I don't feel the need to do any more of that. But I continue to go to conferences and take classes, just to stay on top of the ever-evolving um, landscape in my chosen field. All right, so next. So the next tip, now we're getting kind of more into nitty gritty, if you will, tactical, uh, save for a rainy day. One of the first things I like to make sure my clients have is an emergency fund. And that is a set of, a, an account of savings set aside explicitly in case something unexpected happens. So that you're not continually thrown into def defense and running up credit card bills when life doesn't go your way. So uh, traditional wisdom is you need three to six months worth of your living expenses in a savings account for emergencies. That can vary depending on your circumstances and also depending on your risk tolerance, what helps you sleep at night. Uh, so for example, a couple, a two income family where both people are working and both have relatively easy to find jobs might only need three months of savings because it's, if something happens, if one of them loses a job, they're probably gonna be okay. Whereas if you're a family with young kids and only one of you is working and you're pretty senior in your, in your field and it would take you a, quite a long time to find another job, then you might want to go six, nine, maybe even 12 months worth of savings just so that you know that you've got that safety net in case something happens. And it's not just for job loss. It can be for any expense that, where you budget for it, but it comes in, it's larger than you'd expect it. So whether it's an unforeseen health expense, um, car maintenance, home maintenance, something that just is way out of what you would have budgeted for. Um, and I tell people, don't, put the, don't invest, even though you're going to have a large sum of money, don't feel like you have to invest this in the stock market because then when you need it, you can't be guaranteed that it'll be there. Um, so it should be in a high yield savings account. I, for myself, use um, Capital One 360 because they pay, you know, it's still less than inflation, but 0.75% instead of 0.01% at many of the banks. So it's still penny, you know, a pittance, but better than nothing. Um, okay, so that's saving for a rainy day. Uh, the next one where I start getting on my bandwagon is um, pay yourself first. And that's really related to retirement savings. And that phrase just means many of you are familiar with 401k plans and they come out of your paycheck. It's just having it on autopilot so that you don't have to think about it and it's not a conscious decision you have to make. So it really helps because you just get used to living on whatever your paycheck is. So if you can get the retirement savings on autopilot, it's, it's a good idea. Um, I'm finding most people that I work with tend to need to be saving t between 10 and 15% of their income to be anywhere near on track for retirement. Um, and it really varies depending on how early you started. I'm sure you all have seen the charts that show if you save you know, a few thousand a year at age 25 until you're 30 or 35 versus, and what that grows to over time versus if you'd started, waited until 35 to start, you have to save more and you still end up with less than the person that started at 25. So if the earlier you can start and get your money growing for you, the less you actually have to save. So um, start as early as possible and get serious about it. And what I'm also finding in the Bay Area where we've got a lot of people with six figure incomes and you know pretty good jobs and it's high cost of living, you know, you gotta be maxing out 401ks, which are 17,500 a year for each working person. Some people even need to be maxing out an IRA or saving in another you know, taxable savings account just to be on track. So use that 10 to 15% guide based on whatever your income is to figure out you know, what you should be saving. Um, and for those of you with 401ks, I just like to remind you don't leave any free money on the table because a lot of companies will match a portion of your contribution. So if they match 4%, at least be putting in 4% because otherwise you're leaving, leaving money on the table. Um, and this table here I got from I don't know if you've heard about personal capital, but it's one of the robo-advisors in the space. Um, this is a table they put up. And it just shows, based on your age and how many years you probably would have worked, um, a low end and a high end if you'd been maxing out your 401k every year. 
low end assumes it doesn't grow at all, it, you know, just the origin, whatever contributions you put in. And then the high end is if it was growing 10% a year. And so you can see, I'm in my early 40s, I should have between 300,000 and 500,000 if I was maxing out my 401k. Granted, if I'm making half a million dollars a year, just maxing out my 401k probably isn't going to be enough. But, you know, if I'm low six figures, then, you know, that might be enough. But most people see that and they're like, I'm nowhere near that. So, I mean, if that, if these numbers kind of surprise you, you're, you're not alone. You're in good company. But I would uh, put the challenge out there to, you know, to try and take this seriously and, and try and get, get to where you're not too far off. Because the issue is if, if you don't end up with enough saved for retirement, you're going to have a lot of hard choices to make at some point down the road. So the, the more you save, the more flexibility you're going to have to be able to live the life you want to live. Um, so that's all I have there. Okay. All right. Okay. Now my background is investments, so I, I can uh, go on and on about investments, but I'm going to try and keep it relatively succinct to keep us on schedule here. Uh, so once you've got some savings and you need to help it grow efficiently for you, so the money's doing the work for you instead of you, um, you need to get it invested. And uh, I've had a lot of experience in the invest investment industry now and started on Wall Street and now I'm doing financial planning, so I've kind of seen it all. And what I've come to realize, um, both on ba based on practical experience and academic research I've read, is the markets are pretty efficient. You know, there's argument about how efficient markets are. but um, they're relatively efficient. Most new information gets incorporated pretty quickly. Yes, there are anomalies um, that can occur from time to time, and it takes a while for the market to kind of uh, accurately price things. But the research shows that you can't beat the market, and I know this is hard for smart MBAs to hear, but you can't beat the market and you can't time the market. Uh, and this, is, this chart here is one of, one of many pieces of research search that kind of corroborates that. Um, finding and it shows in each different asset class the percentage of the active managers, so they're the ones that are trying to beat the market, not smart the market, the percentage that fail to beat their benchmarks. You can see in almost every asset class it's well over 50%. So instead of paying them their higher fees, because they charge higher fees, and trying to find the few up here that might beat the market, it's much, much easier to just use index funds and exchange traded funds that are just trying to match the market. They're very low cost, they're more tax efficient. Um, and then you know that you're going to get at least what the market's generating. So um, with that in mind, I recommend that people develop a long-term plan and stick to it. So don't try and jump in and out of stocks and bonds and cash based on what Jim Cramer is telling you or, you know, it just, it doesn't work. You might get it right once, but to do that over and over again, odds are low. Um, and stick with it. And then, in, it, you know, invest in a lot of different things, a, a broad range of asset classes because the interesting thing about investment math is things zig and zag at different times and if you combine a bunch of different things into a portfolio it reduces the volatility and that allows your money to grow faster so if you have a, a portfolio and it's all like tech stocks and it goes down 50 percent then you need a hundred percent return just to get back to where you started so to the extent you can dampen that volatility your money is going to grow faster um, and I already mentioned the low-cost index funds. For those of you that really want it easy, these target retirement funds are nice because they'll shift the allocation for you over time. So if you don't want to have to go back in and move your uh, allocation around there, they're a nice option. And then if you, you're listening to the news and everyone's talking and you just feel like you have to do something, um, then rebalance back to your targets because that's going to force you to sell things that have gone up in value because then they're overweight and then buy the things that have done less well because they'll have to be underweight relative to your target. So that's forcing you to do what you should be doing as a wise investor anyway. And it makes you, because it's human nature when things are going crazy to want to do something. So it allows you to take action without doing something that will be detrimental. All right. So that's enough on investing for now. Oh, so my next point, I'm a big fan of using insurance to help avoid financial calamity, but that's Tammy's topic. So... I don't actually have any points there, other than it's important and you should not ignore it. And she's going to talk about it in more detail. Same thing with the next point. Gigi's going to talk about estate planning. It's very important to make sure you're protecting your family and making sure things happen that you want to happen. So Gigi's going to educate you on that topic. Um, all right. So next recommendation is make a plan and review regularly. 
So whether you use online calculators, robo-advisors, a live, in, live financial advisor, financial planner, it's important to make a plan that covers all aspects of your finances, not just your investment portfolio. And then to review it regularly, um, both to make sure you're on track for your goals that you've set for yourself, and also because life changes. Your circumstances are going to change. It, it's not like you create a financial plan and it's like a map and it, you're good for life. You know, it's, you know, it might be good for a year if you're lucky, but then you need to review it periodically to make sure you're on track and to adjust things as your circumstances change. Um, now, when my ongoing work with clients, I kind of put my clients on a schedule where we look at certain things uh, at certain frequencies. And so every year I have an annual review meeting and we sit down and we look, you know, here are the goals you set for yourself. How are you doing versus these goals? I also look at the portfolio more often than once a year, but if you're doing it on your own, at least once a year, you should review it to make sure you're, uh, to rebalance to your targets and make sure everything's still okay. Retirement projections I redo for my clients every couple of years, or if they've had a big change, like a job change or a child added to the family, something like that, I'll redo it when circumstances change. Insurance I like to review every three years. Tammy's going to tell you every one year, I think. The point is, things change, the marketplace changes, insurers enter and leave markets. So it's important to look, and your needs change as well, it's important to relook at it periodically just to make sure you're still appropriately covered and that you're getting the best bang for your buck. And then estate plan, I don't know what Gigi's recommendation is going to be, but with my clients I like to review their estate plan every five years. Uh, the estate laws change and have been changing a lot in recent years. And also your wishes might change, like maybe the person you wanted as guardian for your children you know, you're no longer friends with, or they died, or, you know, who knows? Um, so it's really important to review that type of stuff on some sort of schedule. Um, so that is that. Um, so I think I'm almost done. Last point, and this is particularly important if you haven't saved enough for retirement, is to be flexible. You know, life is dynamic. There's a lot you can control, but there's also a lot you can't control. When I'm doing retirement projections, you know, we can control things like how much we make and how much we spend and save, therefore, but you can't control what the market's going to do. And I run these Monte Carlo projections where it runs 10,000 simulations of what the stock market might do to your portfolio over time. And, you know, if, if you're on a good trajectory, you know, it's like you won the lotto. But then if, if we get in a bad market period, particularly early in the plan, you know, you're in crash and burn scenario, and so you just, that's something you don't really have control over. So that's another reason it's important to review your plan periodically, because you might need to make adjustments, or you might be able to buy that second home, or, you know, it really depends on what the portfolio does for you. And so it's really good to be flexible, because your plan A may not be feasible, and so you need to be thinking what your plan B and plan C might be. Um, and then it's also important, the earlier you can make adjustments, and this is why it's also important to review your plans periodically, you'll have to make a smaller adjustment than if you wait till the very end, you're about to retire, and like, how's it look? And then it's like, it doesn't look so good, and then you have to really, really make big changes. So be flexible and um, review your plans regularly. Okay, this is my last tip, bonus tip for the parents in the room, which seemed like it was most of you. I, get a lot of, I work with a lot of families with young kids, and so I spend a lot of my time talking about paying for college and saving for college and what's the best vehicle and all that. So. Uh, I figured that I would kind of throw that out there so you can uh, benefit from what I've learned. Um, so the first thing I tell people is don't even worry about saving for college unless you're more or less on track for retirement. There are many different ways to pay for college. You don't know where your kid's going to go to college, if they're going to go to college. Um, whereas you're primarily responsible, granted Social Security is still there for the moment, but you're primarily responsible for your retirement. So unless you're saving for retirement, there's nobody that's going to come in and save you. Um, and I'm pretty sure if you asked your child who's about to enter college, do you want me to pay for your college or do you want me to move in with you when, when I'm older? They're probably going to say, I'll figure college out on my own. That's my guess. Um, so anyway, if you are on track or almost on track for, for retirement and you want to start saving for college, the earlier you start, the better because the money grows for you. Um, and even if, you know, you're still trying to get on track for retirement and you just want to start putting a little bit aside just so you feel like you're doing something, that's fine. But just don't kind of divert major dollars away from retirement to saving for college. Uh, I, there's a bunch of, several different vehicles. There's the UGMA, UGMAs, which are really custodial accounts. The asset belongs to the child. 
There's the 529 plans that most states offer at least one. Um, there's the Coverdell ed Education Savings Account. So there's a variety of different vehicles with pros and cons. I tend to be a big fan of 529 plans. They allow you to put the most money in. The money grows tax-free and if you or tax deferred, and if you pull it out for college, it's tax-free. Uh, you retain control over it, so if one kid doesn't need it, you can change the beneficiary to a different child. It can even be a grandchild. It can be yourself if you want to get some other education. So they just have an, a lot of flexibility and control. And there are some plans that are pretty high cost and don't have good investment options, but there are plenty that are lower cost and have good investment options. I tend to use um, the Utah plan for my children. And uh, people will ask, well, shouldn't I be using the California plan? We live in California. And I'm like, the only reason to use your state's plan is if they offer a state income tax deduction, unless it's a great plan, too. And the California plan is, is decent, um, but I tend to like uh, the Utah plan because it's run by Vanguard, so it has very low-cost Vanguard index funds in it. Um, so that's that. Um, and then there are people that will come to me, and they already have these UTMAs and UGMAs set up. And UTMAs and UGMAs are children assets, so in the financial aid calculations, they count at a much higher rate. Now, some of you may be like, there's no way we're even going to qualify for need-based age, so it's not really that important. But to the extent you're kind of on the margin, you know, it's good to not have big assets in your children's name. Plus, at age 18, they become the children's assets, and they can go off and go on a trip, buy a car, and do whatever they want with it. So I tend to encourage people, if they've got them, to spend them down before college so that it doesn't have such an impact on their financial aid, uh, and then the money spent the way the parents want it. Um, and then as with retirement savings, if you can get it set up on a monthly auto deposit, autopilot um, program, that's the best, because then it's not up to you to decide how much to put in and when. And then I like the age-based options, which is like the target retirement funds, where they shift the allocation as the kid gets closer and closer to college. Ideally, it will be all in cash by the time they go to college. That's something to look at because sometimes the glide paths don't have it all in cash and then your principal's at risk. A few years back during the downturn, the 529s got some bad press because some of them weren't all in cash and these people had their savings for college just go down a lot in value right before they needed it. So look, it's important to look at the glide path to see what it's going to be by the time they enter college. But I like those age-based age options. Uh, I think that's it. So... Told you what you need to know, and I'm telling you again. There's my top ten list, and now Tammy's going to come up and protect you with insurance. That's me. No, I'm fine. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having your early afternoon session with us. So 15 years after Tanya and I finished our MBA, here we are, honored to be here. So managing risk with insurance. Um, everything that Tanya talked about is critical for financial planning. I always like to say people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Um, and the same thing is with insurance. So um, insurance is a topic that lots of people, especially colleagues of mine from the MBA program, had said to me when I made a switch about 10 years ago, you're doing this, right? Um, but I, I'm really passionate about insurance, and it's one of those things with my clients. Gigi will probably resonate with her as well. When they're done with really getting their insurance plans in place, it's a checkbox for them, it's relief, it's peace of mind. So what I wanted to walk through today is how to use different insurance tools to manage risk. And insurance, in many cases, I would say usually, is the least expensive way to transfer risk into management. With that, I will get started. Um, the different types of insurance that I'm going to walk through are the property and liability, property and casualty, the financial insurances, that's more focused for my practice, which is life, disability, long-term care, I'll touch on health, and then business insurance. Um, so with all of these insurance types, um, usually, or the most common way of doing it is having pure risk insurance. So pure risk insurance is you are willing to pay dollars, premium dollars, to transfer risk from you and your family or you or you and your business to the insurance company. You hope there's no payout. The insurance company hopes there's no payout. You're thrilled if you don't even have to deal with the insurance company. That is pure insurance risk. 
And typically, as you get older, as you accumulate more assets, as you have higher income, the amount that you can lose is much greater. And so you need to be transferring actually more risk to the insurance company. I have a lot of clients who like to say, I hate insurance. OK, but I really like what it does for me. So call it something else. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, um, insurance, I think, I think insurance can have a, you know, have a bad reputation for many reasons, but we all need it. And unless you have the means to really self-insure, I think most people feel that it's important to, to have the protection. So call it, call it what it is, but if you need it, make sure that you have it and that you understand what you have and what you don't have. So this is a financial planning pyramid graphic that I like. Um, I don't know if you can see it well or not, but the bottom is the wealth foundation. And that has types of insurance. It has the emergency fund that Tanya talked about making sure you have. It has the wills, which Gigi's going to go over. But basically, as you are building up your wealth in life, like any kind of pyramid, the, the stronger that base is, the kind of higher you can go with your building. And so early on in someone's career, they are their biggest asset, having the life insurance and the disability, of course, the health, the liability. All of that is critical so that as your wealth accumulates, um, and then as you get older and you're in retirement and you're worried about wealth preservation or planning to transfer wealth to the next generation, you can end up going higher and higher and focus more knowing that you know, it's, the pyramid's not going to completely topple over because it's too skinny, the basis. So the first type of insurance I'm going to touch on is property and liability insurance, otherwise known as property and casualty insurance. So property insurance is financial protection against the loss of physical property. So this is the auto, the homeowners, the kind of basic insurances that I'm sure all of you have. The liability insurance is financial protection against the loss caused to others. So that's personal injury, um, personal liability, that's a defense cost if you're in a terrible lawsuit. Um, so going into a little bit more detail on the, the auto, the home, umbrella, and earthquake, the kind of property and liability insurance, these are types of insurance that typically it's renewing annually. Um, you know, you get the statements. Usually it doesn't go down, unfortunately. You know, your car insurance many times can go up. Times when maybe it can go down is if you have that speeding ticket and then you do great for three years and it comes off, then maybe it can go down. And, and those are the sorts of things where I will say, stay on top of it. Make sure that you check in with your agent. Make sure that you're getting all of the multi-line discounts and, and all of that stuff. These are the types of insurance that you're not going through any sort of health underwriting with. So you know, if you can pay less, if you are comfortable taking on more risk and having higher deductibles, which for many people that makes sense, you can get those premium dollars down, great. This is pure risk insurance. Um, Earthquake insurance, this is not my area of expertise. I don't help clients with property and casualty insurance, but I get a lot of questions from clients, especially in the Bay Area. Um, I will say with this one, a lot of it has to do with risk exposure. So it's, you know, how recently was your house built? Uh, I heard a, an expert talking earlier this week, actually, and they used uh, the date of 1994. If you've, you know, redone your house or it's a new, new construction after 1994, you're probably in pretty good shape. It depends. Are you, you know, in the Oakland Hills? Are you down in Palo Alto? I mean, a lot of this has to do with where, where the physical location is. And then a lot of it has to do with liquidity and risk, what your mortgage is, and how much risk you want to transfer. I have, um, I have clients who will say, like, I, I know it's silly and it's a waste of money and it's a lot of money, this earthquake insurance, but it's peace of mind. Great. You can sleep better at night. It's, it's not, it's, there's a lot of gray area, I would say, with that type of insurance. Umbrella insurance I'm going to get to in a minute. Um, and then, again, I think working with an agent or broker who does annual reviews on a property and casualty insurance is important. So one note um, about the, these clients who hate insurance, I have a, a client who, they don't have a mortgage anymore. They're older, mortgage is paid off, and they were saying how much they hate insurance. I said, well, why don't you cancel your homeowner's insurance? They kind of looked at me funny and said, are you kidding? I have like a million and a half equity in this house. And I said, but you don't have to have that. Right? When you were younger and you had a mortgage, the bank required you to have home loan insurance. The minute your mortgage is paid off, cancel it. 
like, are they crazy? Of course, no one's gonna cancel. So this is, again, this is the type of thing where homeowners you have, if you have a mortgage, auto insurance you have to have. Some of these other insurances people don't have, but the more they learn about it, then I think you're in a position where you can decide, do I want to take on that risk or transfer that risk? Umbrella insurance. So umbrella insurance is a very inexpensive way to transfer a lot of risk. It's not an insurance that is required. I have a lot of clients who don't even exactly realize what it is. So the basics of a, a personal umbrella insurance is your homeowner's insurance and your car insurance will have a level of liability coverage many times you know, half a million dollars. If you have an umbrella insurance and typically it's for a million or two million, five million, ten million, that's personal liability insurance. So you get in a car wreck with someone and they sue you for three million dollars. Your car insurance is going to cover a certain amount. Your personal umbrella pol policy will cover the rest if it really gets to that point. Um, you have a pool, you have a trampoline, you have kids, kids have friends, you have a nanny, you have people who clean your house, a person comes to deliver a new couch, they slip and fall. We live in a litigious society. That's why people have personal umbrellas. So this is the kind of peace of mind that if you are sued. And these lawsuits are happening more and more. So um, it is very inexpensive, and it's typically the carrier that you have your auto or home insurance who you will pick out of the home. Life insurance. Um, so life insurance is something that I work with a lot of clients on and I feel very strongly about. Um, many people are very underinsured in the amount of coverage that they have. Um, most people who have employers have some amount of group coverage. Typical is you know, one or two times salary. For most people, that's not nearly enough. It also goes away the minute you leave that employer. And so most people want to have, you know, it's great if you have some group coverage, but they want to have the amount that they really need to protect their family in you know, their own personal plan. Um, I have never had a client who's had a spouse or a parent or someone pass away who said, Gosh, they really had too much life. You know, it's, it's, and it sounds really morbid, but we have to make jokes. We're talking about life insurance. So life insurance is a financial tool, and, it, and it's used for different stages in your life. For many people who have young kids, it's the worst case scenario. It's the, you know, God forbid I don't come home tomorrow. Can the family, can the kids stay at the same school? Can, you know, can they have the same mortgage? Can they, can they afford life? So that's kind of worst case scenario planning. Um, and some people look at that and they say it's temporary. Temporary for some people can mean five years, for other people it can mean 20 years. But that is kind of an initial life insurance plan. People use life insurance later in life as their assets grow significantly for estate tax planning purposes. So Gigi will touch on this a little bit, but quick example, right now if you're a married couple, the exemption for estate tax is a little north of like 10 and a half million for a married couple. If I, you know, a client is a business owner or they have significant wealth, their estate's worth $20 million. When both pass away, their estate tax due is, you know, it's gonna be 40% uh, of the 10 million. Anyway, they'll take out a life insurance policy <coughs> that then their beneficiaries can use that, pay the estate tax, and the estate stays intact with their real estate business assets. So that's one use. Um, business owners use life insurance a lot for business planning purposes. So startups, a lot of them, the angel investors or the will require that the founders, there's enough key manager, an angel investor put $3 million into a company, the founder, you know, rides his bicycle every day to work, I've had a few cases like this, he'll say, I'm, I'm okay with investing in you, I'm not so comfortable with your biking skills, I want to make sure there's a key man policy for $3 million, the amount I as the investor put in, on you as the key person or founder. Another one is to fund buy sell agreements. So a lot of small businesses, their business owners, you know, partner A and partner B. Partner A dies. In many situations, if they don't have a buy sell agreement or it's not funded well, now partner B is in business with partner A's spouse. No one likes that situation. The spouse wants, you know, buy, buy my share. I want the cash. He doesn't want to be in business with her anyway. If they have have funded their buy sell agreement with even a simple term life insurance policy, that will pay out, the business stays intact, the spouse gets the cash, and it's a lot happier. Than 
So those are just a few examples. Amounts of coverage. Um, this, you know, many times people will work with a financial planner or they'll work with someone like me to help them figure out what is the right amount and what is the right type. You look at income, you look at assets, you look at liability, you look at the goal of the insurance, you look at lifestyle, how expensive, kind of all of those different things. Um, types of coverage, main kind of basic types. There's term life insurance, which is for a, I call it temporary, you're renting the insurance five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And then you have permanent life insurance policies, universal life, whole life, that are for the period of someone's life, whether they die prematurely or they live till 120. We're all gonna die at some point, permanent life insurance pays out at home. And it's important that you're with a financially strong life insurance company. So life insurance is something that you do underwriting for. The younger you are, the healthier you are, the less expensive it is. So typically, it's, you're going to have it for a long period of time. It's not like car insurance where you're reevaluating every year. Disability income insurance. Um, and that's kind of a downer. So uh, disability income insurance. This is to protect you in the event that you are still alive, but you are disabled. You can no longer work. And presumably, your costs and health costs and all of that are, are higher. It is very expensive to become disabled. Um, most people who have an option to have group coverage, that is the way to go. And many people don't understand exactly what they have from a benefit standpoint. It's a good thing to kind of check in with HR, look at your benefit packet. But a typical group disability coverage will be something like 60% of your income up to a monthly cap of 10000 6000 8,000, something like that. For many people, that works. They don't need their own own separate individual disability. For executives, highly compensated employees, a lot of times we take out a supplemental policy. Um, people who are their own business owners and need to go through individual underwriting. I'm going to skip forward because we're running a little late. I'm just going to touch on long-term care insurance for a minute, and I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Long-term care insurance um, industry is going through a lot of changes, and this is becoming a bigger thing in the U.S. Um, because people are living longer, and health insurance does not pay for long-term care. Um, there are more and more companies that are actually starting to offer this as group coverage, and many times that can be a good deal. The most important thing with this is making sure it's portable, meaning if you leave the company, you can take it. Other insurance. Excuse my typo. That. Um, so health insurance, I'm not going to touch on that. Everyone kind of knows what that is. Lots of changes going on with Public California and the bonds, et cetera. Business insurance, these are other things that many people need. Um, errors and emissions insurance, business liability, working with comp. I would say with all of these types of different insurances, the most important thing is understanding what you have, even as simple as like reviewing your auto insurance policy. What, what do you have? And then deciding if you don't want a certain type of insurance, just understanding the risk you take by not having it. Um, and it's important to evaluate all of this over time. As you go through life change events, that's the time to really evaluate what you have. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Gigi. Thank you. I'm going to continue on with this really super uplifting theme of um, what happens when you die. But I am going to talk about estate planning. Okay, which one? Yes, there we go. Okay, estate planning. So um, we don't have a ton of time here. Your takeaway is you should have one, but I'm going to give you some uh, information on what happens if you don't have an estate plan. Okay, the estate. When we talk about the estate, it's everything you own. Your net worth. It includes the death benefit of your life insurance. So when Tammy talks about getting life insurance, you pay estate tax. You have to be careful because when you buy insurance, it's part of your taxable estate. So there are vehicles to use to keep insurance out of your taxable estate. But when we're talking about what it is that you own, it's everything. It's your retirement plan, it's your life insurance, it's your home, it's your bank accounts, your car, your furniture, your jewelry. You'd be surprised about what people fight over. It's not always the money. A lot of times it's the stuff. Um, I had to have a police standby once for the three daughters to fight over dad's tools. Not one of them wanted the screwdriver, right? They, but they were mad about how dad treated them when they were kids. So estate planning is how we figure out who gets what when you die, okay? It also takes care of you when you lose capacity, which is more and more of a reality for people. But um, they say about 85% of people don't have a will. 
And the reasons why people don't have a will, that in my experience, is they, they don't think they have enough money to require it. They, uh, they can't deal. They just cannot deal with thinking about what's gonna happen when they die. Or they don't care, it's an option. Um, or they, they, for the parents, they cannot decide on the guardian. Um, if you don't have a plan in California, no plan, no problem. State of California's got one for you. Here's our leaders, if you want them to decide for you where your money's gonna go, have at it. This is where our um, state of California's late, you know, been for the last however many years. Okay, what happens to your money if you don't have an estate plan? If you have a beneficiary designation on the asset, if it's a life insurance policy, you've paid it to your spouse and then your children, that's where it goes. If you have a pay on death, a transfer on death designation on a bank account or a brokerage account, that's where it goes. If you have a joint tenancy account, so many married people have their accounts either in joint tenancy or something that's called um, community property with right of survivorship, okay? Those types of assets carry a transfer on death designation within it by operation of law. So that's a last man standing gets the property. An old school estate planning is if your parents are elderly, you're an only child, you're an adult, your parents can add you to their bank account, add you to their home. If the order of death is correct, kid gets the asset. Okay? Now you have to guarantee me that you will die in the right order. Okay? Um, and I always tell people, you don't have to go, oh, I should do the estate plan, but I like you don't have to do an estate plan. You can either not die or do the plan you pick. Right? Up to you. Okay, if you don't have a plan, who gets the money? If you have not put a designation on the account, there is no beneficiary listed, or it's the type of asset where you can't have a beneficiary, like your home. You can have a joint owner, but you don't want to put your minor kids on your home with you, or even your young adult kids. So if they get into an accident, you could lose your home because they're predators. It's not a great option to, to do this joint ownership thing, so if you don't have a beneficiary designation, you don't have a will that tells us what to do, the state of California decides for you. Okay, state of California has what's called intestate succession. That's the order of death. Um, if you are married, 100% of your community property automatically goes to your spouse. Your separate property is divided. And separate property is anything that you, earn, uh, you earned before you got married or anything you have inherited even if you inherit it during your marriage. That is separate property. Now, you can choose to make it community throughout your lifetime, and a lot of people do that but um, it would remain separate and it would be divided by law between your spouse and your children. If you don't have any children, your spouse and your parents or your spouse and your siblings. So that's the family farm you know, that you inherited. California says, well, if it's your inheritance, it should go back to your side of the family in some manner. So that's what intestate succession says. If you're not married, then um, you're gonna go to your heirs in succession and that's your, your children and grandchildren. Then you go back to your parents, they will get it next, followed by their kids. So that would be your siblings, and then your nieces and nephews, and if there's none of them, we go back up the chain. Grandparents, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, and it will keep going seven generations. At the end of the seven generations, if we cannot find next of kin, and I guarantee you got a third cousin four times removed that's waiting for your money, but at the end of the day, State of California gets it, okay? Now, if you leave all your money <laughs> the way the state of California wants it to go, it's gonna go all to your spouse, okay? You may be totally fine with that plan. It depends on who your spouse is. Put a little picture of Anna and Nicole, just in case that's who you married. Um, and your children, under intestate succession, if you have not set up your estate plan, children get all the money the day they turn 18. So I've got Lindsay and um, Justin Bieber there just to show you. I could have put Brittany too. But, you know, I, had a lot of, I had a lot of choices on what happens when your kids get money too young. Um, you'll hear a lot about probate. People want to know what is probate, what's, why is, what's the problem with probate. Probate is simply the court supervised process by which we transfer assets. Okay? So, you know, if Tammy and her husband own her, their home and they get hit by a bus without an estate plan, who owns their home? Well, I've already told you the state of California tells us that we give it to the kids. But nobody actually owns it anymore because the only people who can sign the deed are dead. 
So nobody owns the house. The house will literally sit unsold. Nobody can sell it, nobody can lease it, nobody can refinance it. No one has any control over that house because the legal owners on title have died. How we get permission to sell the home is we go to court. We get a court order that says, okay, you know, Tanya as executor can now go in and sell the home and give the money to the people the court says is okay, which would be the kids, because we know the law says the money goes to the kids. But I don't have any way to do it without a court order. That's probate, okay? So probate is there to help us transfer assets on death. The problem with probate is it's really time consuming and it's really expensive, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But it is there to protect you. Now, the most important thing to take away from this part of the presentation is that all wills go through probate. So a lot of people say, I've done my will, I'm good to go. Well, you are in terms of telling us who gets the money, right? And so you can say that my kids, they don't get the money when they turn 18. That's a terrible idea. Look at Justin Bieber and his mugshot. We want to make sure the kids get their money for education and for health and for support and all these great things that we can set up you know, not at 18, you can do that in a will, but the will has to go through probate. Okay, now for estates that total under $150,000, you don't go through probate. There's a small estate procedure that we do, and for spouses, if it's all community property, we use what's called a spousal property petition. Okay. Um, oh, this is the um, performance piece entitled the probate experience. Okay. The problem with probate. It's very, very expensive, okay? So now, we set most people up so that they don't have to go through probate, but when we get a call and somebody says, my aunt died and she had a house in Berkeley and there's no will, we do a little probate dance, right? Because they're like, probate is really lucrative for the attorney. We get paid 4%, not my, I didn't do it, 4% of the first 100,000 I get paid. And this is gross value. I get paid 3% of the next 100,000, I get paid 2% of the next 800,000. So if you stop at a million, that's $23,000 paid to the attorney by law. Now the million dollars of value is a gross value, not a net value. So your home has a fair market value of a million, but you have a $900,000 mortgage, I still get paid $23,000, okay? Now it's 1% over that. That $23,000 is payable not only to the attorney, but also to the executor. So on your first million of gross value, it's a $46,000 fee, plus the cost of probate from the court's perspective, which is it's 300 and, I think it's $470 to open the probate, it's $470 to close the probate, it's $50 to lodge the will. It is, you know, any time you turn around in probate court, you have to pay them. They require that the property be appraised and the probate court assigns you the, the appraiser and you have to pay them their standard fee. You don't get to choose. Um, so what we like to do instead is to get you out, keep you out of probate, right? If we don't have to go to probate, it's better for everybody, it's better for the kids, better for the heirs. The type of estate planning that you can do, you can do in a will or a trust. They say the exact same thing. And the nice thing about estate planning is that you can do lots of things. You can provide ongoing protection for the kids. You can make sure your assets are distributed the way you want. You can take care of the dog. You can take care of nieces and nephews. You can take care of your parents if they're aging and you're already supporting them. We can set all that up. You can do it in a will or in a trust. You can also disinherit your children, right, if you wanted to. You can ease business transitioning. Um, you can hold assets in trust for the lifetime of anybody you want, including your spouse. So this is important um, if you are already in a blended family, you have stepkids, or you are married to someone who is not the parent of your children. You wanna make sure you provide for them for life, but when they die, they have to give the money back to your kids. Um, so you can do that. The difference between a will and a trust is simply that wills go through probate and trusts do not, okay? So they say the exact same thing, but because wills don't take effect until you die, we have to take that will to court and the court has to supervise the distribution of the assets. So that will is public record. If you wanna Google Jerry Garcia's will, you can look at it, it's pretty interesting. You can Google anybody's will. They're all public record, okay? Um, if, because they don't take effect until you die, if you lose capacity, the will doesn't help you at all, right? You, someone would have to have a power of attorney for you 
to help you during the period of incapacity. Um, and if you have like a house in you know the Bay Area, but you also have a house in Tahoe and you're on the Nevada side, we have to go through probate in California and in Nevada. So the will is only good for assets that are situated in the state of California. You can take that will to another state, but you have to open a separate probate. Um, a trust will completely avoid probate. The way it works is that instead of Tammy and her husband owning her home, we transfer her home to a trust. The trust is revocable. She can have all the money out of it during her lifetime to do anything she wants. Invest the money, put money in, take it back out, whatever. It's invisible. It's like an invisible bubble that wraps around you. But when she and her husband get hit by that same bus, <laughs> sorry, the trust owns the house. So before, remember, nobody owned it because the owners died? Well, the owner's the trust. Trust keeps going. So although she and her husband can't be the trustees anymore because they're gone, we'll put in a successor trustee. So the trust will continue beyond the death of the people setting it up, and that's how it works. We don't have to go to court to ask for a court order to transfer it because the trustee has the permission to transfer it the next day. So they're totally easy to work with. They're private. You can't. So you can Google Michael Jackson's will. This is very interesting. And it says, I leave everything I own to the trust that I set up. And you're like, oh, but what does that say? That's totally private, OK? And the trust in California can hold assets in any state. And I recently did a probate where the, um, the person who set up the trust, he set it up. He didn't put anything in it. So that's not really very helpful. If you don't put anything in your trust, what's it going to do? Well, he owned property in California. He also owned property in Louisiana and in Arkansas. And so we had an Arkansas probate, a Louisiana probate, and then a California probate overseeing the whole and 46 beneficiaries, yeah. some of whom have died since we started this process because it takes so long. The probate process in California is about 18 months to 24 months to get through a probate right now in California. The Alameda County Probate Court is about a month behind in opening the mail. So you can't, the earliest hearing date you get, if you came to me and wanted to open a probate now, the earliest hearing date we would get to start your probate would be two and a half months from now. That's when they're beginning to hear matters today. And then every time you need a hearing, it's another couple months or a couple months. So you're looking at one and a half to two years in a probate, if you're lucky, um, 50 to 60, $70,000 on the probate. So most people want to try to avoid it. Um, estate tax, just touch on that for a sec. Tammy already mentioned it. Currently, the estate tax rate is 40%. It is on everything you own over $5.34 million. So it's a problem you want to have, actually. Estate tax is a problem you want to have. Because it means you have $5.34 million plus in assets. Okay? It includes life insurance. The estate tax comes in the form of a credit, and your $5.34 million is fully transferable to your spouse if you have one when you die. So that means the surviving spouse can have actually $10.68 million to pass, available in credit to pass to the kids tax free. So you don't have a tax problem unless you as an individual are 5.34 and or over 5.34 and as a couple are over 10.68. It's your total, total net worth. Lots of sophisticated estate planning tools can be used to avoid estate tax, to reduce estate tax. You take chunks of money, you take it out of your, your taxable estate. You put it in a trust that you can still access and use, or your kids can access and use. We have lots of ways to reduce estate tax. But as the numbers go higher and higher, it's less and less of a problem for people today. Gift tax is related to estate tax, and it's something that's very important. When we talk about the 529 plan, you're not allowed to give money to people without tax. The IRS has said, if you're going to give money away, we want part of the gift and estate tax. The gift and estate tax is a combined tax, it's a unified tax, um, and it's in addition to, a, to income tax that you've paid your whole life. But that $5.34 million that you have on death, you, it's available during life as well. The only thing that's not included as gift tax is anything that you pay directly for education or health. That's why we can pay for our kids' college educations without thinking about estate tax. Um, and health needs as well. But the 529 plans, you can only fund them. You're typically cautioned that you should only fund up to 14,000 a year should go in there. And that's because the IRS has said up to 14,000 a year is de minimis. We don't even want to hear about it. It's not worth our time. So up to 14,000 you can give each year to as many people as you want. This is really good for grandma. Like if grandma's sitting on a lot of money, potentially on a taxable estate, 
If she gives $14,000 a year to each of her kids and grandkids, she removes all that money from her taxable estate. I call that the 40% off sale. They usually go for it um, if they have enough money. So that's how 529 plans use the annual exclusion. Now, if you've given the $14,000 to the 529 that year, you can't give any more money to your kids, technically. We can set up trust to do that. Um, guardianship, people a lot of times ask me a lot about guardianship. If you're parents of children under the age of 18, you should have guardians nominated. Um, the guardian of the person is not the same as the guardian of the estate, so be careful about there. You want to have some alternates. If you can't decide, just know it's okay if you can't decide. The court will decide for you. Um, and if, uh, worst case scenario, the estate will take custody of the kids, put them in foster care until it's all worked out. Right? They can also emancipate, which is why the Party of Five picture's up there, because they can emancipate the oldest and have them in charge of the youngest, which is what happened in Party of Five, in case anyone was afraid. <laughs> okay, so have a complete estate plan you want to have. Consider at least a revocable living trust. At a minimum, you should have a will, so at least we can make sure your dog gets taken care of. You know, you, everything goes where you want it. The right person gets your record collection. I've got people who have stamp collections, gun collections, all sorts of things they care deeply, deeply about. Um, but the people who are going to take it don't want it. Um, I had one guy leave all of his money to his nine cats. His money, do what I want with it. And if you do have a revocable trust, make sure it's fully funded. You want to make sure your house is in there, all your bank accounts are titled in the name of the trust. This is where I see a lot of plans fail. Um, and you want to also have a power of attorney, a health care directive, um, a HIPAA authorization, that's the Privacy Act in California. Um, and then if you're married, you want to consider a property agreement, a prenup, a postnup, a spousal property agreement of some sort. And you always want to review those beneficiary designation forms to make sure they're accurate and up to date. And the thing about naming your kids as beneficiaries of life insurance and um, retirement plans, if their kids are under the age of 18, they can't have it. You can put them on the form, but the insurance company will not pay the money to a minor. So if you get all this insurance to make sure your kids are cared for, they can't get it until the day they turn 18. And the day they turn 18 is not the day you want to give kids money. <laughs> okay? So what you can do, if you've set up a revocable living trust, you can name the trust as your beneficiary. Then you've got your dad, your brother, your best friend as a trustee who will take that money use it for education. My kids are getting their distributions when they turn 25, 30, and 35. They'll get 25%, then another 25%, then the balance. Money can always be used for education and health and support. But they don't get the outright distributions till they hit those three ages. And I did a quarter and a quarter and a half. To me, that's like Vegas, Vegas down payment. <laughs> right? They blow it, they blow it. I've done the best I could. At that point, I'm dead, right? So. Okay, so that's it. We actually don't have very much time for Q&A. We have like just a couple of minutes if, you, if anybody has any questions for any of us. Um, and certainly I can stay after to ask questions. Yes. Yes, the online ones, you know, you can do Nolo Press, you can do there's a bunch of them that you can do online. They're not terrible. The biggest issue I see is they're not funded. Most people don't fund the, the trust once it's set up. There's a lot of questions in there. You're just not going to have the, the knowledge to answer is the problem. People start them and they can't get through the questions because they don't know the answer. Do I want a Q-tip trust? I don't know. I don't know what that is, right? It's three years of law school and then another LLM on top of that to figure out what that is. <laughs> but it's better than nothing. California will even recognize a handwritten will. Um, estate plans, we charge about 3,300 for a complete estate plan for a married couple, um, but the prices vary. We're about mid-range in the market. Some people charge five to 10,000 for married estate plans. Singles, about 1,800, 2,000. Um, if you already have an estate plan, this needs to be reviewed, amended, that's a lot less expensive. You know, we can work on pricing, but the ballpark's about 3,000 on a married um, estate plan. Questions, but the first one on fourteen thousand is that per person you can give them fourteen thousand dollars? Yeah, so you can give every okay. one of us in this room fourteen thousand. Awesome, <laughs> that's what I want to do. Yeah. And then the second question is on uh, five twenty nines. What is sooner versus later? Like sooner is before they're born. Sooner is while they're in elementary school. Sooner is. You can certainly do it before they're born because you can always change the beneficiary. You started out and you name yourself as the beneficiary, and then you change it to be one of the kids. 
But what would you recommend? I think I've been told to do it like in high school or middle school versus elementary school just because of saving options or? I'm not the financial advisor, so. Okay. Oh. And you have to live yeah, the five years. So I'm sorry, you said the parents could put 20000 in? Each parent can put fourteen. so a married couple can put twenty eight per child. Oh, interesting. Per year. Okay, and then I'm sorry, last question. When you define savings, do you find that as 401k IRAs and CDs and investment property, or is it just 401ks and IRAs when you say savings? When you say savings, that's for you, I think. So I, I think in your presentation, you were talking about, you know, start saving early, and then you had the numbers up at the age, and then you had, this is the number you should have for savings at that age. Okay. Or property as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. So you said that it's the fourteen thousand to twenty-eight thousand a year, but you can basically give that to your kid in the five twenty-nine. But wouldn't that so the, if, if you do that, then it removes it out of your estate. It funds the 529, but then does that mean the 529 has to be open in the kid's name in order for that to be? You're the owner of it. Okay. If they don't need the money for college, it's the child, or the child. And you can take it back out with penalty. The It's a completed gift for gift tax purposes and estate tax purposes, but you have the right to take it back and pay the penalty. But you have to file some uh, gift tax form in order to remove it out of your estate? If you front load with the five years. Just so telling the IRS, it. I already used up mine for the next four years. If you die in that period, Trust. it's brought back into your taxable estate. Hmm. Okay. Mine only cost four hundred or something. No, no, just that one year. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's good. But. Child's assets okay. when they're applying to college, do they look at? No, it counts as the parents. Which is still weighted. The best way to do it is if the grandparents set it up, because they won't ask about the grandparents' assets. So the grandparents set up the five twenty nine and fund it. That's the best way. Right. So if you're gonna, if you have two hundred thousand in your five twenty nine plan, and college is gonna cost four hundred thousand, right? Borrow the first two years. Use the five twenty nine for the second two years. Because if you use the five twenty nine for year one, they'll say, "Hey, how'd you pay for last year?" And now you go, "Oh, well, my grandparents set up the five twenty nine plan for me." Well, now you got to disclose it because that's how you paid for college the first year. So back end the college education with the five twenty nine plan. But you know, that's what you talk to them about is how to how much to fund in there. Whether you want to, you got to be careful about overfunding it. Um, my uh, my part of it is the gift and estate tax component, but it's a great way to remove money from an otherwise taxable estate. To have things adjusted. Yeah. So we switched. We switched other beneficiaries, like people who take our kids, because they, they start changing as people. <laughs> We have, we have the room till. Yeah, I'm happy to stay. Yeah, I was just curious about the order. I have a new board. And obviously, we don't pay them. That's a lot of money to live in trust. Is there ever a way to start to have more assets for you to set it up? Yeah, I mean, the right time is before you die. <laughs> okay. so, uh, but what you do is you set it up, right? The trust sits here, and assets are going to go in and out during your lifetime. You don't call me every time that happens. I set it up for you. It's good to go rest of your life. And then you'll put assets in, you'll take assets out. And people often say, I haven't bought a house yet. Shouldn't I wait? Like, no, it's way better to have the trust already set up. Because when you do buy your home, buy it right in the name of the trust. And then it's super, super easy. So in terms of order, will first and then trust? You do it together. 
Because when you have a trust-based plan, remember that it's supposed to hold all of your assets. And so you're going to get a will, but all it says, it has one gift. I leave everything I own to the trust. Yeah. So if you've written out a long will, though, that includes a lot of personal information on where things should go. We take all that and just, change that, move it we to just parlay that right into the trust. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Why do you need a will if you have a trust? Because people don't fund them. Because my guy who had property in three different states and none of it was named in the trust. Well, then who does it go to? Well, the trust had these 46 beneficiaries, and I'm not even kidding you, 46 beneficiaries. There are people who are getting 1 46th of 15%. Right? And so that's what he wanted, but the property was in his name. So in order to make that happen, the property had to be given to the trust, which then gave us the distribution order. So we go to the probate. The wills left everything to the trust, which then left all the money to the beneficiaries. So in, you have to have both. In that example, you, have to go through probate. you do have to go through probate. Oh, three probates. And he'd set up a trust. Yeah. So the key is that if you set it up, make sure you fund it. Because if you don't fund it, it doesn't. it's a house of cards. It only works if it's funded. If one of the spouses dies, but the other one's still alive, you still, it still goes through probate? No. Or only for the, the but if there's joint assets, they don't go through probate, but the singular, the, it's not Possibly, their, possibly, okay. right. So married couple, he's someone, you've got, you're married, but you have an account in your name. Right. Yeah, that's, it's not going to go through probate. It's going to go through a spousal property petition, probably. But unless your wife's on it as a co-owner or it's in the name of the trust, the only owner died. So that's what you, that, you know, I know who's supposed to get the money most of the time. My problem is Bank of America. My problem is Wells Fargo. I'm like, give me the money, right? We have a spouse standing right there at the bank in tears. Can't get the money. Even if they're a beneficiary, it's still, it's still If they're a beneficiary, that is an estate plan. So that it would pay to the named beneficiary. Without probate. Without probate. Uh, That's correct. Probate is only for assets that don't have a beneficiary and that are not don't have a co-owner or a beneficiary and are not owned by a trust. Should retirement funds not be kept in a trust? They should not be kept in a trust. They're individual retirement accounts. You keep them in your individual yeah. name, but you can name the trust as a beneficiary. It's there's some tax consequences there, you'd be very careful with that. And we we do consult on that kind of stuff all the time. Well, for people who call me and go, hey, I'm about to get on a plane. <laughs> it's been on my list for 15 years, and now i got to do it. So I can do them, very, you know, I have done them very, very quickly for people. Typical time frame is about one to two months. From the time you come in, you know, we do a lot of information gathering. I'll send you a set of draft documents with a flow chart, a little picture in the front that shows you how everything's going to go. Um, I do a review meeting with my clients because this staff of 300 pages of legal documents is so overwhelming. But I do... Um, a review meeting, I'll walk through everything, and then you do a final meeting to review and sign. And we do, we charge flat fees so that the conversations can keep going. You need to understand your estate plan before you walk out of there. So we'll keep talking. And I'm very chatty, so I don't like to fill by the minute. Where are you located? What's that? Where are you located again? My office is in Oakland. Yeah, my office is in Oakland. I live in Piedmont. My business, and my husband went to Hall. That's my only connection. <laughs> but my, um, my business partner lives in Hillsboro. Oh, okay. And uh, so she handles Peninsula South Bay. Okay. Um, so we do, and we meet people at um, our office, certainly in Oakland, but we can meet you at your business during lunch if that's easier. We can meet you at your home if that's easier. You know, before you go to work in the morning, we can swing by the house. Or, you know, for me, if you live in the East Bay and you've got little kids, put the kids to bed, I'll come over. If you offer me a glass of wine, I'll do it, and we'll stay and we'll talk about it. <laughs> you know, so we're very flexible. We, I have three kids, my business partner has three kids. Um, well, there's four of us in my office. We have ten kids between the, the four of us. So we, we get it. Life insurance, does that connect on the name of the trust? Or? It should um, typically pay to the trust. The beneficiary should be the trust. If it's insurance that is not for estate tax planning purposes, then it should you should consider paying it to the trust. If you have beneficiaries who are minors, or um, you can always keep your spouse as your primary beneficiary. That's who you got it for. Make your spouse the primary. But what happens if your spouse, you and your spouse die together? I mean, we, we are like doom and gloom at my office. We're always planning for worst case scenario. 